It is now my great pleasure to introduce W. Brad Wilcox. Um, Brad Wilcox is the director of the National Marriage Project and associate professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. And he's a member of the James Madison Society at Princeton University. His first talk today will be on marriage complementarity and why they matter, how marriage affects our kids, communities, and church. Dr. Wilcox. Thank you, Chris, for that gracious introduction, and Bishop, for your opening prayer and words of wisdom here. So the new conventional wisdom uh, in, our, in our culture, from Hollywood to the halls of academe, is, is that marriage uh, doesn't really matter. Kids, we're told, need not enjoy the shelter and security of a married home to thrive. Take, for instance, Jennifer Anderson, reflecting on a recent movie that she starred in. She's saying, quote, women are realizing it more and more knowing that they don't have to settle with a man just to have that child. Or in her book on maverick moms, which celebrates women who are raising kids without men, Cornell psychologist Peggy Drexler claimed that, quote, women possess the innate mom power that in itself is more than sufficient to raise fine sons. This message is also taken up by the media as well, with Pollyannish family talk about the decline of marriage, not being a problem for our day and age. This past spring, for instance, Matthew Iglesias at Fox gave explicit voice to the idea that the decline of marriage cannot be linked to any meaningful declines in the welfare of women and children. And these messages from Hollywood, from the halls of academe, from the media, have not been lost in today's young adults, as all of us know. In fact, a large minority of millennials believe that marriage is becoming obsolete and that a growing variety of family forms are a good thing, as this peer report here suggests. It's all of a piece with the increasingly laissez-faire or libertarian view of family life that many adults today find compelling. There's only, of course, one problem with this new laissez-faire view of family life, and that's, of course, that it's not true. On average, we know that men, women, and kids are more likely to flourish and to realize the American dream when marriage grounds adult intimacy and the rearing of the next generation. We know that marriage provides meaning, direction, purpose, and stability to our deepest needs for bonding and belonging in the family. And we also know from the science that marriage offers one of the most durable paths to happiness in America, especially for those who embrace an ethic of marital permanence. This is what the science tells us, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today, this morning, um, in this uh, conversation we're having about uh, marriage uh, and the family here in America. So I want to begin by really kind of talking briefly about sort of what's happening on the ground demographically in the country. Um, and what we're seeing basically is there's a growing marriage divide um, as marriage retreats here uh, in the United States. So in the last half century, we've seen a dramatic retreat from marriage marked, as you all know, by increases in divorce, in cohabitation, in non-marital childbearing, and single parenthood. But I think what some people don't realize is that this retreat has been much more consequential for the poor and now for the working class, lower middle class, and for minorities, uh, and of course for kids, uh, than it has been for other Americans, as these next couple of slides will, uh, will tell you. So we see here, for instance, in terms of giving you a sense of the big picture, is that today about you know, a little more than two-thirds of, of kids are living with uh, two parents. Uh, but of course, this is somewhat um, maybe deceptive or, or not entirely informative because you know, many of these kids are living in step families. So there's been some instability in their lives. And this next slide here um, gives you kind of the bottom line. And the bottom line here is that about one in two kids will spend some time apart from an intact married uh, biological family. So that's sort of the, the bottom line here in terms of thinking about how kids uh, in the United States are being affected uh, by this retreat uh, from marriage. But again, it's important to realize that this retreat from marriage and its impact on adults, especially children, is not affecting everyone equally. So what we're seeing in America today is that our families are increasingly separate and unequal when it comes to marriage. There's a growing class divide in marriage, such that college-educated Americans 
are enjoying relatively stable um, and happy marriages, but Americans without a college degree who still make up a majority of our citizens are seeing more instability, uh, more unhappiness, and more single parenthood um, in their own families and their own communities. So take, for instance, divorce. We can see there's a dramatic difference by education when it comes to divorce. Um, those Americans who are college educated, as this slide here suggests, are much, much less likely to be divorced than those who have less than a college degree. So Americans who don't have a college degree are about three times more likely to get divorced uh, here uh, in America. And, and today, really, one of the bigger issues sort of driving family instability is not divorce, but it's having a child beginning your family outside of the bonds of marriage. And again, what we see here is a pretty dramatic class divide when it comes to non-marital childbearing. So again, women who are college educated, the vast, vast majority of them are having their kids uh, in marriage. But women who don't have that college degree um, are much more likely, as this slide suggests, be having their kids um, outside of marriage. And what I think in some ways most disturbing in this particular slide here is the, the sort of trajectory among what I've called middle Americans, that is Americans who've got a high school degree or some college, um, has been kind of rapidly increasing when it comes to kind of cohabitation and non-marital childbearing, as this middle slide suggests. And for me, um, as a scholar, my concern about this is most principally concentrated on the effect it has upon our kids. And again, what we can see as we sort of look at sort of how this plays out for children is that again, kids from college educated homes are enjoying comparatively high levels of family stability. About 80% of 14 year old girls in this country who are born to college educated moms are still living with both their parents, usually in an intact married household. So they're not really experiencing this retreat in the same way that that kids um, from less educated homes are, as this slide here suggests. So again, there's a dramatic difference by class and how this is playing out. It's affecting working class, poor, minority communities uh, much more than it is college educated, more upscale, uh, more affluent communities. So the bottom line here in terms of understanding sort of how this retreat from marriage is playing out uh, is that there is, there is some good news here, and that is that college educated Americans have really since the 80s kind of figured out how to navigate this new world, how to live and establish fairly stable families. But the bad news clearly is that there's a retreat from marriage underway and it's affecting our poor, our working class Americans, um, our you know, minority families uh, a lot harder than it is um, their better educated, more affluent peers. So how and why does all this matter for, particularly for our kids? That's something I want to take up in the next couple of slides. And again, one of the, the big consequences here of this retreat from marriage is that more kids are spending time in a single parent family. And you know, there, there was this line in the academy and in, in, in the media that I think is still there to some extent, that you know, the family isn't really in retreat or isn't in decline, it's just changing. What we're seeing is changing. Uh, families and you know not necessarily a big deal kids are pretty resilient well is that view true when you kind of look at the big picture one important point to make here is that most kids who are raised by a single parent or a step family or some other kind of family arrangement turn out okay I was raised by a single mom and I think my sister and I turned out okay uh, we graduated from college we haven't been arrested all that kind of stuff but I'm also a sociologist, and I want to basically underline this, this basic idea that there's a risk factor here that's clear here, that kids who are uh, raised outside of an intact uh, married home are about two or three times more likely to experience a serious negative outcome, you know, like delinquency, for instance, or depression, or dropping out of high school or college. Um, and so, again, there's a, there's a risk factor here that plays out both at the individual level but then also at the community level. So if you're in a community where there are lots of single parents and you're a school teacher or a police officer, you can imagine how this may be particularly consequential, this differential um, in, in risk for kids born and raised in intact families versus non-intact families. So what does that kind of look like? Um, it, well, it looks like in terms of sort of practical outcomes or, or real outcomes to think about, 
that there is an increased risk for kids of psychological, social, and economic problems when they're raised outside of a two-parent home. And then more particularly, when we think about particular outcomes, uh, one big issue we're talking a lot about today, and I think rightly so, because we have really the highest rate of incarceration in the world, um, is this issue of incarceration, uh, spending some time in jail or in prison. And what we know is that boys who are raised in a single mother household are about twice as likely, even controlling for family income, education, race, ethnicity, net of all those factors, about twice as likely end up in prison or in jail by the time they turn 30. Uh, if they're not living with their married mother and father. So not having a dad to look out for them, to discipline them, to model an appropriate form of masculinity is a big deal for our boys, as this slide here uh, suggests. But dads also matter for daughters, right? We all know that. They matter for daughters. And actually, this is a little bit wrong. What it, this should be is that basically the risk factor is, is the highest for, for girls whose dads left between zero and five, and intermediate for girls whose dads left between the ages of six and 18. So the point simply is that the earlier dad is gone from the household, uh, the more likely the daughter is to have a teen pregnancy. And that's of course because she's not getting his attention, his affection, she's not seeing appropriate parental love uh, model between mom and dad, or um, sort of a marital love model between mom and dad. Um, and she's more likely to fall prey to either teenage boys or to young men uh, who don't have her best interest at heart. So again, dads and marriage matter for daughters, as this slide here uh, suggests. And then too, when you think about kind of not just sort of the negative outcomes of incarceration and teen pregnancy, but sort of the positive outcomes um, in terms of you know, getting the education that you need to flourish in today's competitive market economy. What we see here in this slide is that both for kids from less educated homes and for kids from better educated homes, um, their odds of graduating from college, both for women and for men, young women and young men, are markedly higher um, when they come from an intact um, married home compared to a non-intact family. So the blue here is, is graduating from college, um, the yellow is coming from some kind of non-intact family. So again, there's a link between marriage and a positive educational outcome for our kids. And then when you kind of extend the vision uh, beyond just childhood into young adulthood, what we're seeing is that young adults, again, both men and women, are more likely to be gainfully employed and to be working more hours um, when they come from an intact family as compared to a single family. This slide here suggests that on average, they work about 160 hours more um, as, uh, as young adults um, per year compared to their peers uh, from single parent families. And there are also similar findings here in terms of just being employed you know, uh, in the first place. So what I'm basically showing you is some of the ways in which kind of over the life course, kids who are raised in intact married families with their mother and father um, are more likely to flourish and less likely to fall afoul of various uh, challenges that you know, kids and teens face in our, in our culture today. But let's talk a little bit more about some of the specific uh, ways in which kids can land um, in single parent families or kids can experience family instability. Of course, one way that that happens um, is divorce. And when I first started studying sociology of the family back in the, in the 1990s, this was my big concern, divorce. Um, because that was sort of the gateway through which many kids in our culture were ending up in single parent families or experiencing some kind of family turmoil in their lives. Um, what we see in the, in the most recent research is that we can distinguish between different types of divorce in terms of its effect on kids. And what's interesting is that the effects of divorce seem to be least serious for kids in high conflict marriages. So when mom and dad are screaming at each other on a regular basis, or when their you know, plates flying through the kitchen on Friday night um, or you know, Saturday afternoon. Um, when there's a, you know, when there's a, a separation, uh, that seems to be kind of, you know, on average, good for kids because they're being separated from that, you know, that pathos, if you will. But kids who are in divorces where there's a low conflict situation, where you know, one parent is uh, unhappy, 
um, or is, uh, you know, moving on to a new uh, partnership, um, or is otherwise, you know, seeking a kind of a, a, you know, an end to the marriage. It's in those low conflict divorces where kids are just kind of oftentimes just blown away. Um, and they're left disoriented and disillusioned in the possibility of, of lifelong love um, and marriage in particular. So they're the ones who are hit hardest by, uh, by a divorce, particularly when it comes to sort of their own relationships as young adults and adults down the road. And of course, the unfortunate reality here is that in our culture today, when we take a more accommodating view of divorce, about two thirds of divorces today involving kids um, are these very low conflict uh, divorces that are the most deleterious for kids, kind of emotionally and, and socially. Now I mentioned that when I first kind of got into this, this subject of, of family, I was most concerned about kind of divorce and single parenthood. But it's important to, to sort of note that today, I think the bigger issue facing our kids is cohabitation, not divorce. And that's because more kids in America will experience a cohabiting relationship that will be, will be raised in the context at some point um, in their childhood by either their own parents who are cohabiting or by often their mom and unrelated male boyfriend who are cohabiting. Um, so this is kind of a more common reality to say for our kids uh, than is divorce. And actually part of here of the story is that divorce rates for those who are getting married have actually come down. That's some of the good news here um, since 1980. Um, so marriage is actually a more stable institution now than it was at the height of the divorce revolution in the 1970s uh, and the 1980s. So today I think cohabitation is kind of a gateway, if you will, for some challenging outcomes as we'll see in the next couple of slides here. So when you look at things like um, drug use, dropping out of high school, uh, depression, as these bullet points suggest, what you see is that surprisingly, even though you have two parents in the household, the outcomes for kids in cohabiting uh, families or cohabiting households look a lot like the outcomes for kids in single parent households. Pretty, pretty similar when you actually look at, you know, for instance, in studies, the coefficients, the odds ratios, et cetera. Okay? So this is kind of, you know, in some ways surprising. Why is the case that cohabitation doesn't really seem to do much for our kids is, an, is a question we can ask ourselves. But it's also important for us to realize that on one particular set of outcomes, kids in cohabiting uh, relationships actually do worse than kids in stable single parent households. And this set of outcomes is the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse of our kids. Uh, you know, we see obviously in this data, this is from the federal, federally funded, federally run fourth national instant study of child abuse and neglect here. We see that kids who are in this sort of middle category where they have one bio parent and un one unrelated adult in the household, usually mom and unrelated male boyfriend, are much, much more likely to be physically, sexually, or emotionally abused. And what's also interesting too about this particular slide right here is the safest place for our kids, uh, literally the gold standard, um, was colored gold by the government, um, and that's the intact biological married family. Okay, so that's the safest place for our kids uh, on average here uh, in the United States today. So you know, why is it that cohabitation is risky for our kids? Well, we all know that I think Americans look on cohabitation as a, as a sort of a, an arena for more freedom and flexibility in your relationships. But the flip side, of course, to that is there is less commitment, there is less trust, there's less sexual fidelity, there's more violence, and there's less parental supportiveness uh, for the home environment uh, as compared to a married union that has that commitment, that long-term view, et cetera. And then a related point here, of course, too, is that there's more instability in cohabiting relationships because they do have more freedom and flexibility or less commitment, okay? And that instability is not very good for kids. If you have kids, if you work with kids, if you know kids, if you babysit kids, you know they thrive on stable routines with stable caregivers, okay? And that's what cohabitation is not likely to give them. And this next slide just gives you kind of one empirical snapshot of that reality for our kids. We can see uh, here that kids who are born to crowding parents are much more likely 
to see mom and dad break up than kids who are born to, to married parents. So clearly, there's a link here between stability and marriage uh, for our kids. So before I, I read you this quote, I want to just underline four points about kind of why it is that marriage matters uh, for our kids. Um, and basically, the first point I want to say is that intact marriage increases the economic resources available to kids. You have two parents, uh, and today many of the, in many households, uh, both parents work at some point, but also connects you to two sets of kin who can help with um, you know, support of one sort or another when you're raising children. So one point is about the economic benefit of marriage. A second point is about uh, stability. Kids in intact marriages are more likely to have, again, stable routines, stable caregivers, and stable kind of uh, neighborhoods. They're more likely to sort of stay in one place, which on average is a good thing for kids. A third point to make is they're more likely to get the consistent attention, affection, and discipline from their parents than kids in step families or single parent families. Um, and part of the story here is just when you have two parents on deck who have kind of known that child from infancy, um, they're better able to relate to that kid, dispel one another when someone's um, getting tired or exhausted, um, and you know you can imagine the benefit that has for, for parenting. And the fourth point is that you have both parents and kids are all biologically related to one another. And we're learning more and more these days about how this biological relatedness uh, facilitates um, kind of a connection with uh, one's kids and one's siblings and one's parents in ways that tend to foster um, a more harmonious household. And also a household, again, that's less likely to be subject to uh, some kind of domestic violence of one sort uh, or another. So these ideas were articulated by Sarah McClanahan, who was my professor at Princeton, um, and Gary Sandiford, professor at the University of Wisconsin, um, and their book for Harvard University Press on single parenthood. And what they said, just to kind of summarize what we've just been discussing, is this, quote, if we were asked to design a system for making sure that children's basic needs were met, we'd probably come up with something quite similar to the two-parent ideal. Such a design, in theory, would not only ensure that kids had access to the time and money of two adults, it would also provide a system of checks and balances that promoted quality parenting. The fact that both parents have a biological connection to the child would increase the likelihood that the parents would identify with the child, be willing to sacrifice for the child, and it would reduce the likelihood that either parent would abuse the child." Unquote. Okay, so I've talked about family structure, I've talked about biological relatedness and how those things are connected to the welfare of our kids. I want to talk for a few minutes about this issue of um, or what the, the French might call vive la différence, and that is sort of the way in which uh, mothers and fathers, uh, on average, you know, there are always exceptions to these averages in our social world, but on average bring distinctive talents to the parenting enterprise. And I'll begin here by quoting from Ross Park, who's kind of the Dean of Fatherhood Studies um, at the University of California. And he says that, quote, evidence suggests that these differing styles of maternal and paternal interaction may provide unique opportunities to learn different kinds of skills that are important for children's intellectual and social competence. Okay. So what's he talking about? What are the kinds of different you know, talents we might think about? Well, I think for dads, what we see today is that there are advantages when it comes to providing, when it comes to how they play with their kids, how they challenge their kids, and how they discipline their kids. Um, and I think these are connected both to sort of cultural factors related to how we're socializing uh, boys and men, but also to natural factors, like for instance the role of testosterone um, in, um, in men's lives. So concretely, what does that mean? So, you know, a lot's changed, obviously, in the last 50 years when it comes to how we divvy up uh, earning. And there are more and more families today where women are you know, primary or equal breadwinners um, for their families. But it's still the case that in married families, um, it's typically the dad who's more likely to take the lead when it comes to, uh, to breadwinning. Um, and so today, married fathers make about 69% of the family income. And of course, money matters um, in terms of putting a roof over your kids' heads, um, helping to educate them, feed them, clothe them, et cetera. And now for many of us, you know, shuttle them back and forth to soccer or piano or 
you know, or football. All these things are expensive. So having you know, a father who is there and who's working hard um, to support his family financially is, of course, viable for uh, our kids. I think what people may be less cognizant of is that there's also a way in which dads tend to play with their kids differently. And if you walk through a park, uh, a public park on a Saturday morning, you'll often see pictures like this one here, okay, where you know, the dad is taking the toddler and just throwing the kid up. <laughs> yeah. and of course, his mom, if mom is there, there's sort of, you know, her eyes are like this. You know, like, what, what is he doing with, with my child? Um, so dads are more inclined to engage in rough play. Um, they're more likely to surprise or excite their kids. You know, more likely, in, you know, whether it's throwing the baseball in the backyard or playing tennis at the local um, tennis court, whatever it might be. They're also more likely to roughhouse with their kids, you know, maybe on, this, on Saturday morning or maybe to mom's annoyance on Thursday evening before bedtime. Um, <laughs> but these kind of interactions that dads have with their kids, both with their sons and their daughters, are important. Uh, we know that, for instance, from psychologist John Sneary, that, quote, children who roughhouse with their fathers quickly learn that biting, kicking, and other forms of physical violence are not acceptable. Okay. And what's interesting is that Ross Park's work, again, he's kind of the dean of father studies at the University of California, suggests that boys who have more experiences roughhousing with their dads are more popular um, in elementary school than boys who don't have a lot of uh, physical interactions uh, with their fathers. So my point here simply is that there, there's a growing body that suggests sort of the way in which dads play with their kids um, helps their kids control their own bodies um, and sort of navigate their social environments. We also know that dads uh, have a unique role to play um, in challenging their kids. Um, they excel in pushing their kids to embrace life's challenges, difficulties, and opportunities in the outside world. Um, dads are more likely than moms to encourage kids to engage in novel activities, to be independent. This starts at a very young age, you know, as toddlers. Again, dads are more likely to kind of just encourage a toddler to do something that mom might not think is appropriate. Um, and it extends out across the life course. You know, they're more likely to introduce their sons and their daughters, it's important to note today, um, to the world of work, of sports, of civil society and politics. And the psychologist Daniel Paquette, who actually has done a, a, a study that kind of, I think, illustrates this point, uh, it was in France, and they were looking at how moms and dads um, in a group of sort of toddlers were likely to interact with their kids who were learning how to swim. And what they found is that when mom was in the pool with the toddler, she was likely to hold the child like this, face to face, okay? Whereas when dad was in the pool with the toddler, it's much more likely to turn the kid around and have the child face out into the water. And this is a pretty nice way of thinking about how moms and dads tend to interact with their kids in a different way. So Paquette says that, quote, Fathers play a particularly important role in the development of children's openness to the world. They also tend to encourage children to take risks, thus permitting children to learn to be braver in unfamiliar situations, as well as to stand up for themselves. And then, again, this is a, a point I think we would all kind of, in some ways, you know, take for granted, that dads have a distinctive kind of approach to discipline. It to be stronger, bigger, have a deeper voice. <laughs> and these things can get kids' attention in obvious ways, right? We also know that they're more assertive, they're less likely to bend rules uh, for their kids than our mothers. And I want to underline this key point right now. And the idea here is actually not that they're better at discipline than moms are, because of course we all know there are times when kind of a mom's intuition, her flexibility is what's really needed, right? Not, not kind of just you know, coming down like this. But what I think is sort of the subtle point that Yale psychiatrist Kyle Pruitt has made is that the difference in how moms and dads tend to discipline their kids is viable for our kids. They kind of learn two different approaches to authority that will serve them well in school, on the, you know, on the playing fields, um, and in, in the workplace. Because of course in some, for instance, workplaces, you know, it's a pretty top-down approach. You know, in the military, for instance. Whereas in other workplaces, it's a much more collegial thing happening. 
Um, and so again, having different types of authority embodied in the home can be helpful for kids as they sort of learn to navigate um, both their home and then, of course, later on in the social world. So Pruitt says, quote, fathers tend to be more willing than mothers to confront their children and enforce discipline, leaving their children with the impression that they, in fact, have more authority. And then he goes on, of course, to say that they benefit from both styles of, of discipline, the maternal and the paternal. So this leads us into the next uh, discussion. That is, that what are mom's distinctive talents? And again, these are some of the ones that you see in the research, things like breastfeeding, communication, nurture. And I think we can also talk about how these are connected to how women are socialized, uh, but also to how they are biologically different on average. How they have, for instance, more oxytocin running through uh, their bodies, um, which is kind of a bonding hormone compared to, uh, to dads. So first, on the breastfeeding point, obviously, at least right now, only moms can breastfeed. Um, <laughs> And breastfeeding is often physically pleasurable, as a, as a side note I hear anyways, um, and, and read. Um, there are health benefits for moms, of course. They have low risks of um, both breast and ovarian cancer when they breastfeed. And there are health benefits for, uh, for kids. Um, it's uh, found to protect against about 15 maladies. And this is why the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that infants are breastfed until about age one. Okay. So, Clearly, this is one way in which moms establish a physical connection to the child that's unique and powerful, um, both kind of probably at the physical level, but also at some kind of social and emotional level as well. A second way in which moms tend to excel is interpreting the expressions, um, the utterances of infants and kids. Uh, moms are better at interpreting their infants' cries of hunger and pain. They can kind of distinguish them more readily than can fathers. Um, and we also see, too, there was a study done in Boston where they looked at sort of how babies responded to mom approaching and dad approaching. And what they found was that when, actually, when dad approached, the child's kind of, you know, perked up a little bit and sort of was, you know, like this. Whereas when mom approached, they just kind of settled down. You know? <laughs> so this is sort of, you know, one example of the way in which, you know, um, there's a kind of unique connection for moms and kids. And then this extends through adolescence, we know that adolescents report that mothers are more in tune with their moods, um, the ups and downs of their moods. We have a few teenagers now in our household um, than our fathers on average. And this also, of course, translates into communicating with kids. Uh, moms have an advantage when it comes to communication. They tend to use more words with their kids and use them more precisely um, than do fathers. It's interesting, this also, I think, applies to marital relationships as well. <laughs> Uh, they're better at interpreting the tone and content of their kids' words than our fathers on average. And they're also less likely to forget the content of conversations with their kids uh, than our fathers. I mean, it's sort of shocking. Um, but what's interesting about this is there's work being done that suggests this is not tied just to socialization, but also to the way in which the brain um, functions. Um, that women have a larger corpus callosum. They have more dopamine in the language center of the brain, which there's a kind of a biological, at least correlate to all this. That women's brains are structured in ways that facilitate this kind of communication uh, more so uh, than, our, than our fathers. And then again, all this plays out in terms of nurturing, um, that emotional connection uh, between moms and kids. Um, and again, the biological point is that women have more estrogen, uh, they have more oxytocin, and these hormones um, are linked to more nurturing behavior. So there's kind of a biological substrate here that seems to work in tune with the, the socialization uh, piece here that we would expect for, uh, for moms and for kids. So Ross Park, again, from University of California, says that, quote, mothers are more emotionally available to their adolescents, and mother-adolescent diets spend more time together than father-adolescent diets. Mothers maintain more open communication and emotional closeness with their offspring during adolescence. And I think, you know, today when we have a much more uh, vigorous debate about sort of gender and egalitarian um, roles and whatnot, but, you know, people might wonder, well, is this just sort of an American thing? And, you know, if you look kind of cross-culturally, what you see is that, no, it's not an American thing. Um, that preschoolers in countries and places as different as Kenya, India, Mexico, the Philippines, Japan, and the United States um, are much more likely to have this kind of close ties between mom and kids, particularly as you know, infants and toddlers. Um, and even one of the most sort of egalitarian um, 
sort of cultures in the world, the aqua pygmy culture, um, you know, it's only the case that dads are taking care of infants 12% of the time. So moms are doing a lot more of the care. Um, and even when the mother is not taking care of the infant and the toddler, in the vast majority of cases, it's a woman who is doing that caregiving. Okay? Um, and even in Sweden, one of the most egalitarian countries in the world, again, um, moms are much more likely to be taking time off um, to care for, for kids. So why is this? Well, what I would suggest to you is that women's advantages in breastfeeding, understanding, communicating, and nurturing their kids help to explain why the role of motherhood tends to be more strongly tied to the care of children, especially infants and toddlers, um, the world over. And even today, you know, obviously it's the case in the United States that women are more likely to provide kind of direct care for infants and toddlers um, than are uh, married fathers. And then finally, can you think about this sort of cross-culturally? Again, the Rutgers anthropologist Helen Fisher said the quote, in every culture in the world where anthropologists have looked, in 168 societies, even where women are exceedingly economically powerful, women do the vast majority of the raising of very small children. Women are interested in babies. They bear the babies. They've got the high levels of estrogen associated with the nurturing of the very young. So there's a biological story here that we probably need to pay attention to in thinking about how moms and dads interact, particularly with younger kids, infants and toddlers. And then finally, in terms of thinking about what does this mean for uh, outcomes for kids? Well, here the evidence is more suggestive than conclusive, but work done by Rob Pelkovitz, Ross Park, um, the Canadian psychologist that I mentioned before, Paquette, suggests that kids who are exposed to distinctive styles of fathers and mothers are more likely to flourish. In particular, Pockwitz's work suggests that sort of having um, these distinctively feminine and masculine styles and body in the household is linked to some better outcomes uh, for kids. Okay, so we're going to turn quickly now, before we wrap up, to think a little bit about how marriage affects not just kids, but also men um, and women. And I want to begin in this section of my uh, talk this morning by mentioning kind of two objections that you hear today um, in, some, you know, in some quarters about marriage. I think particularly when it comes to men, you know, this idea that marriage is kind of a ball and chain, you know, that men um, have their freedom restricted uh, when they get married. Of course, there's some truth to that, as we'll see in a second. A second objection is that marriage is kind of crippling to women. This is articulated by Jesse Byrne, a feminist in her book, The Future of Marriage, where she talked about his marriage being different from her marriage. And she argued that his marriage benefited men but her marriage left women, quote, anxious, depressed, psychologically distressed. So is that, is that view of marriage and women correct? Well, in thinking about how these sort of things play out, um, one sort of way in terms of health is just to think about this impact of, of smoking, for instance, just as a point of comparison. So would you guess that the average man will lose one year, five years, or 10 years from his life by smoking a pack a day? What would be kind of your guess? 10, Ten would be, a, I think, a good guess, and that's because that's, that's correct. And what's striking here is that, um, down at the bottom here, is that uh, men who get married in their 20s or early 30s and stay consistently married over the course of their life um, to, uh, to their wife on average, gain about 10 years. Um, so if you, have, if you know any smokers out there, any guys who are smokers, <laughs> it's important to <laughs> um, get and stay married to kind of balance off the, <laughs> the effects of smoking. But the more serious point here, of course, is that marriage tends to have health benefits for both women and men. But the effects are more pronounced, to be honest here, for men uh, than for women. We'll talk about, about why that's the case you know, in a second. But again, on the health front at least, both women and men benefit from stable marriage, but men benefit, per, you know, I think, particularly, or in particular. So what's going on here? Well, part of it's just, you know, we tend to, to, to flourish um, when, our, when we're kind of, we are social animals. And when we're in a relationship with someone, provided that this is a key qualifying factor, particularly for women, um, our bodies, our immune systems function better when we are married, when we're in a social relationship with others, as the slide here um, suggests. 
We also tend to have, when we're married, someone who's sort of monitoring or encouraging us, nagging us to do certain things, like go to the doctor um, or avoid you know, certain things. And here, what we see is that men in particular benefit from marriage because in the wake of getting married, they cut back pretty dramatically on risky behavior, like going to a bar late at night on Saturday or riding a motorcycle or something else. Okay? So when men get married, they tend to cut back on these kinds of behaviors that obviously affect their health and mortality. But women also benefit too, especially in the sense that they are more likely to have access to better health care uh, when they're married, partly for financial reasons. Okay, what about kind of marriage and economics? One key point to make here is that, again, I think men are affected more by marriage. Uh, we know that men tend to work more hours after they get married, about 400 hours more compared to single men. Um, this is equivalent single men. Um, they also tend to work more strategically. So a Harvard study found that compared to single men, married men were less likely to quit their current job unless they had found another job that they could move into. Okay? Whereas single men, if they were upset with their employer or whatever else, they would just quit that first job. Okay? And then they would sort of try to find that second job. It's also the case too that married men were less likely to be fired. Um, these are actually controlling for a lot of background factors um, compared to their single peers. So kind of marriage on average seems to make men work, again, more strategically, more responsibly um, in ways that, that benefit them and their employers and their families. And not surprisingly, this, this adds up to more money for married men. So married men tend to make about $16,000 more as young adults, and about $18,000 as middle-aged adults compared to their equivalently, basically, credentialed um, single uh, peers. Okay, so there's kind of a premium, a marriage premium for men when it comes to, to money. But what about women? You know, and it used to be, frankly, that marriage was linked to um, a penalty in women's individual income. Um, but that's no longer the case um, as gender roles have shifted, you know, in important ways, as you're all aware. There still is a motherhood penalty, of course, for women. Uh, women who are moms are more likely to cut back from uh, the workplace or to get out of the workplace for a time. Um, but what's interesting is that the motherhood penalty is lowest today among married moms compared, of course, to single moms, in part because they have a, you know, a spouse in the picture to help them uh, navigate uh, juggling a working family. And then when you look at kind of family income and family assets, married women enjoy markedly, significantly, higher family income and family assets um, compared to their peers from a similar background um, who are unmarried uh, or single. Okay? So the bottom line is pretty positive for women financially. Mental health, there's not really a big gender divide here. Uh, we see that both married women and men are less likely to commit suicide. Um, they're less likely to report that they're unhappy. And we can see too that um, married women and married men are more likely, compared to their unmarried peers, to report that they're very happy. And again, we can understand we're social animals, we tend to flourish in social relationships and communities and families, and so having that spouse there can be helpful for support, a sense of meaning in life, and particularly I think for men, a sense of status, like I am a married father, I have a certain status in my eyes of, of my wife, my kids, my neighbors, my fellow congregants, my in-laws, my parents, uh, and that's, I think, you know, tends to be good, especially for men's uh, mental health. And a final topic here when it comes to sort of adults and outcomes is sex, a topic that gets a lot of attention um, in one way or another in the pop culture. And you know, here what we see is that in terms of frequency, uh, coabiting women and men actually have more sex, um, followed by married women and men, followed then by single women and men. But when it comes to sort of fidelity, what we see is that married uh, couples enjoy the most fidelity, um, as this slide here suggests, and they also enjoy both women and men the most emotional satisfaction from their sex um, compared to their cohabiting peers um, and their peers in longer term uh, relationships um, who are not living together um, or in short term relationships. Um, so there's a kind of ladder of commitment, as this next slide suggests, where it looks like more commitment gives people more security and satisfaction, uh, more opportunities to learn about their partner, um, and to focus their investments both physically and emotionally in their partner in ways that redound to their satisfaction 
um, with their sexual lives. And again, marriage is at the top of that commitment ladder, and that's why I think in part, married couples report more um, emotional satisfaction with their sexual lives. So in terms of kind of adding all this up, what I would say is that for both women and men, we know that there is uh, or there are sacrifices um, that people make to get and stay married um, that revolve around less autonomy, fewer choices, more compromise, et cetera. But speaking in sociological terms, you know, these sacrifices are worth it because they pay considerable dividends on average. For men, and particularly health and their personal income, uh, for both, I'd say they're actually family income, family assets, their sexual lives, their mental health. And what's clear too from this is that sort of the critique of marriage is something that benefits just men but not women from Jesse Bernard and other feminists uh, back particularly in the 70s uh, no, longer, no longer holds. Okay, so we're almost done with this one. What I want to conclude by saying is that we shouldn't listen. We shouldn't pay much attention to the family Pollyannas in the pop culture, the academy, and the, and the media, who would say that you know, marriage doesn't matter, that a variety of family forms are just as successful for our, our kids and for our adults. Because the truth is that stable marriage matters, and remains one of the best paths to happiness for men, for women, and for kids um, in our country. And I think one way to sort of put this is that social science tells us that the adventure of marriage is best undertaken in a community of friends and family that honors and values marriage. In other words, a lot of the benefits that I've talked about are most likely to be experienced by couples who both share a commitment to lifelong marriage, who both make those sacrifices, those investments um, in one another, uh, in their marriage, in their family. And that's why the paradox of contemporary marital happiness is that such happiness is most likely to be found by seeing marriage as an opportunity to make an irrevocable gift of oneself to one's spouse and to one's family. Thank you.